And he began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land, and he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, that means listen, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up, and some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up, and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit, that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sin should be forgiven them. And as we covered in the last chapter, the unforgivable sin is for one who understands God's overall plan to not allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them were they to be delivered up during the hour of temptation. This spirit of stupor then upon those blind to the truth of God's word protects them from committing the unforgivable sin and serves as a cloak of innocence. And that's not to make light of what the scribes were accusing Christ of in the last chapter, but I don't think I have to tell you that to call the work of the Holy Spirit the work of the devil, which is what the scribes were doing, is an extremely dangerous thing to do. And notice after Christ warns them, they back off of that particular accusation. But regardless, their lack of understanding played to their advantage because as we know from Luke chapter 12, which we went over already, as well as breaking that word blaspheme back to the Greek using the Strong's Concordance, understanding with clarity the truth of God's word and to understand that to not allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you when delivered up during the sixth trumpet would result in the second death, which is the death of the soul in the lake of fire, because that's the only unforgivable sin. That's why those who follow Satan after the thousand years are finished are blotted out of existence, because they completely understand what they're doing at that time, being in spiritual bodies. But as it stands now, most people are blinded to the truth to protect them from committing the unforgivable sin, because that would be counterproductive to God's will, which is that none should perish in the lake of fire after the thousand years are finished, but that all should come to repentance. And you might read Romans chapter 11 in verse 7, the election hath obtained it, the truth that is to say, and the rest were blinded. And in verse 8 it says, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, that's the spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. So there you have it. And if you were to skip ahead to verse 32 of Romans chapter 11, you see the reason why. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. So now we better understand the meaning of this 12th verse of Mark chapter 4, which is quoting from Isaiah chapter 6 verse 9, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable, the parable of the sower, that is to say, and how then will you know all parables? And so we see the importance of understanding the parable of the sower. And you'll want to cross-reference this with Matthew 13, where you'll also find the parable of the tares of the field. The thorns we just read of in the parable of the sower even being symbolic of those tares, which are the Kenites, the sons of Cain. And remember the curse placed on Adam when Eve was impregnated with Cain, who was not Adam's son, but was of that wicked one, the devil, that is to say. Thorns also in thistles, as you can see in Genesis chapter 3, verse 18. The Kenites being the result of the impregnation of Eve by Satan, the serpent, also known as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's what happened, and that's what the parable of the tares of the field is about. 
So when you understand the parable of the tares of the field in Matthew chapter 13, you'll understand who the thorns are in Mark chapter 4, the sons of Cain who through the four hidden dynasties distract from the truth and distort even the most basic decency to the point where most people have no concept of reality whatsoever. But you stay focused on your father's word and don't let them pull you away from it with any of their snares whether it be education which includes the mainstream media hollywood video games etc economics where you go into debt unnecessarily by biting off more that you can chew politics with its endless pointless arguing back and forth when it's all the same group ultimately both parties being infiltrated by the communists and especially religion where in most christian churches the truth of God's word isn't even taught, so why waste your time there? It would be time better spent to study our Father's word for yourself unless in the rare instance you're blessed to attend a church that actually does teach chapter by chapter and verse by verse, in which case praise God for it. You're extremely fortunate to say the least. As you can see in Luke chapter 8, beginning with verse 5, a sower went out to sow his seed, and we ask a word of wisdom from our Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, this being the same parable of the sower written of in Matthew 13, as well as Mark chapter 4. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. This we'll call group number one, and it's made up of those who never were Christians, in other words, in the futurist sense, the other two-thirds in the last two verses of Revelation 9 who were spiritually dead already at that time, 666 being when that third are killed spiritually, including the 144,000 who are separate from the rest of Christianity because they're predestined to come out of the confusion, which is what Babylon means whenever they hear what the Holy Spirit says through those of the Zadok or 232 of that number, possibly. Group number two here in verse 6 being the church in Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2 who are the 144 4,000, in my opinion, that fell upon a rock or stony ground, as it's written in Mark chapter 4, verse 5, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. In Matthew 13, verse 6, he says, when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. The fourth vial in Revelation 16, having to do with men being scorched with great heat, symbolic there of the fire, smoke, and brimstone, which is the deception that comes out of the mouths of Satan's fallen angel locust army and the consumer stage thereof during the woe of the sixth trumpet when that third dies spiritually because that's when they'll worship Satan instead of Christ which is what Antichrist means the third for the most part being the rest of Christianity who make up the third group you can read of in Luke chapter 8 verse 7 that which fell among thorns the thorns being symbolic even of the Kenites who are the stones worn smooth were supposed to enumerate which is what that word count means in Revelation 13 18 understanding who the Kenites are means understanding who the false rock is that appears in Jerusalem at the sixth seal, the sixth trumpet, and the sixth vial. And the only Christians that don't die spiritually at that time are those of the 7,000 Zadok, or 232 of that number, possibly, group number four in verse eight, where he says, and other fell on good ground and sprang up and bear fruit an hundredfold. That's 100% return. And remember, it's when the Zadok are delivered up and the Holy Spirit speaks through them that the seed of the seal of God God springs forth within the minds of those it was planted within, primarily during the grace period of the fifth trumpet we're now in. So don't ever think you're wasting your time when you're planting seeds of truth from our Father's word. When the 144,000 and whosoever will come out of the confusion and are grafted back into God's family tree, they become part of group four also. Those that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, as Christ says in Matthew 13, 23. Bearing fruit means the seeds you plant. God calls to grow, whereby others are added into the many-membered body also. God's family tree, which is the tree of life. Christ is the true vine, and we are the branches, and he expects us to bring forth fruit. And ultimately, groups two and three in the parable of the sower are made up of those who will be deceived at the sixth trumpet, who at that time become most of the seven churches in Revelation chapters two and three, all but Philadelphia, which is made up of the Zadok, who never bow a knee to Baal. That's who Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
window are symbolic of in Daniel chapter 3. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him and said, What might this parable be? Only the lamb slain can open our understanding to the scriptures, whereby we're not deceived. The seal of God being the opposite of the mark of the beast, and it's only those of the Zadok, who are the church in Philadelphia, that have the seal of God in their forehead throughout the entire five-month-long hour of temptation. 232 possibly, with the rest of the 7,000 being the armies which were in heaven that return with Christ at the seventh trumpet. And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. And in not understanding the whole truth, they're able to be forgiven for worshiping Antichrist whenever they repent, whereby they can be grafted back into God's family tree. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God, those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil, and taketh the word out of their hearts, which means their minds, lest they should believe and be saved. In other words, they never accepted Christ's blood shed on the cross, and are the two-thirds spiritually dead already that you can read of in the last two verses of Revelation chapter 9. They on the rock, or stony places, as it's written in Matthew 13, are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. In other words, in the midst of the hour of temptation, they'll take part in the apostasia called the falling away in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But then when the church in Philadelphia are delivered up, Smyrna, who are the 144,000, as well as those with free will out of most of the other churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, will because of what the Holy Spirit will say through Philadelphia, repent, being then grafted back into God's family tree, whereby they can take part in the first resurrection at the seventh trumpet. And that which fell among thorns, those that make up the other five churches in Revelation 2 and 3, are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. He becometh unfruitful, as Christ says in Matthew 13, meaning they were Christians, but then at 666 became grafted into Satan's family tree along with the Kenites, symbolized by the thorns throughout the word of God, as well as the tares later on in the parable of the tares of the field in Matthew 13 as well. But that on good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. No man, when he lighteth a candle, covereth it with a vessel or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick that they which enter in may see the light. And it's when the sixth trumpet begins to sound that the candlestick of Zechariah chapter 4 becomes ten candlesticks, the two olive trees who are most likely Moses and Elijah will at that time become the two candlesticks in Revelation chapter 11 and when added to the seven candlesticks in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 which are the seven churches as well as the candlestick in heaven you can read of in Revelation chapter 4 verse 5 which is made up of the rest of the 7,000 Zadok you end up with ten candlesticks just as there were in the temple Solomon built as you can see in 2 Chronicles chapter 4 verse 7 the temple burned by Nebuchadnezzar Nebuchadnezzar, who is a type of Antichrist, and the 70 years in captivity to Babylon, which means confusion, is a type of the 70 evenings of the sixth trumpet, the two and a half months that end when the true Christ returns at the seventh trumpet, and it becomes one candlestick again, symbolic of the millennial priesthood you can read of in Ezekiel chapter 44, as well as Revelation chapter 20. The temple built after the Babylon of old was destroyed was believed to have only one candlestick again, as it was in the tabernacle. So again, the many-membered body is all one candlestick, as you can see in Zechariah chapter 4, and when you do the math, there's an eight-and-a-half day period before 666 of the 75 days of the two witnesses, and to arrive at that number, you have to add the three-and-a-half days before the seventh angel sounds, so most likely they're the two olive trees for that eight-and-a-half day period, then at 666, they become the two candlesticks in Revelation chapter 11, and the many-membered body on earth become the seven candlesticks, with the souls under the altar and the fifth seal being the candlestick in heaven, that's ten candlesticks, letting us know who's who during the latter half of the hour of temptation, and immediately after that silence in heaven about the space of half an hour, the seventh trumpet sounds, which is also when the seventh vial is poured out into the air, and the true Christ returns with the armies which were in heaven, gathering those of the seven churches who had repented, whereby they could take part in the millennial priesthood at that time. The good figs you can read of in Jeremiah chapter 20 four that don't return to Jerusalem until harvest time, which as we know from Matthew 13 is the end of the world.
As it's written in Revelation chapter 11, verse 10, the two witnesses, who are most likely Moses and Elijah, having both appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration, tormented them that dwelt on the earth during the time of their testimony, which was three and a half years in solar time, but has been shortened to 75 days, as opposed to the 70 evenings the 70 years in captivity to Babylon were a type of, which is also the time frame of the consumer stage of Satan's fallen angel locust army, who will only be able to torment those who have not the seal of God in their forehead. In the first two and a half months in the Nar, Swarmer, and Devourer stages, but then at 666, when Satan appears as the Antichrist in the consumer stage, when most Christians die spiritually and receive the mark of the beast in their forehead. For every positive, there's a negative, and as it's written in Revelation chapter 11, verse 6, the two witnesses have power to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And that word smite in the Greek comes from number 3960 in the Strong's Concordance, probably a prolongation from number 3817, which you'll also find in Revelation chapter 9 verse 5 describing the torment of the fallen angels as opposed to the torment of the two witnesses. The fallen angels will torment with deception and the two witnesses will torment the deceived with the truth of God's word. And when you read through the first six plagues of Revelation 16, which don't kill spiritually until 6 6 6 when the consumer stage begins and compare them with the actions of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11, it becomes obvious that there are positive and negative plagues. For example, the first plague in Revelation chapter 16 is a noisome and grievous sore on those who have the mark of the beast and worship his image, which is an image of Satan transmitted throughout the earth at 666. The positive would then be the seal of God that springs forth within the minds the seed thereof was planted within before before the five months began when the church in Philadelphia are delivered up and the Holy Spirit speaks through them. The two witnesses, who are most likely Moses and Elijah, figure into the equation because of the eight and a half days prior to 666, when they're the two olive trees of Zechariah chapter 4, where the candlestick there is symbolic of the full, many-membered body of Christ. This parallels Ezekiel chapter 9, where only those who have the seal of God in their forehead survive the spiritual slaughter at 666 when Satan appears as the false Christ. Only those of the Zadok are 232 of that number, possibly. In other words, the church in Philadelphia will have the seal of God in their foreheads throughout the entire five-month-long hour of temptation. The candlestick in Zechariah 4 will at 666 become ten candlesticks, which are the seven churches of Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3. The candlestick in heaven written of in Revelation chapter 4, verse 5, which is symbolic of the rest of the 7,000 thousands of Doc who have lived and died throughout the centuries, and finally at 666, the two olive trees become the final two candlesticks, adding up to ten candlesticks, just as there were in the temple Solomon built, which is the temple burned by Nebuchadnezzar, a type of Antichrist. And again, the 70 years in captivity to Babylon were a type of the 70 evenings, or two and a half months, of 666. The second and third plagues of Revelation 16 involve every living soul dying in the sea, which is symbolic of peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The blood of a dead man is in the son of perdition, as opposed to the atoning blood of the Son of God that brings about everlasting life for whosoever will. The atoning blood of the true Christ is the blood the two witnesses turn the waters to if they listen and repent. Again, the waters are symbolic of peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, as we know from Revelation chapter 17. The fourth plague in Revelation 16 is the fire of deception that comes out of the mouth of Satan's fallen angel locust army in the consumer stage thereof, when their images are transmitted throughout the world also at the sixth seal, the sixth trumpet, and the sixth vial. That's why 200,000 thousand were seen, because it appeared to be an innumerable multitude, but it's only 7,000 fallen angels, as we know from Revelation chapter 11, verse 13. Going into the consumer stage at the woe of the sixth trumpet, after the deadly wound, which is the fifth vial, when the sixth vial is poured out, and that's when all all six plagues of deception kill spiritually those who have not the seal of God in their forehead, which is initially all but the church in Philadelphia, called also Antipas in Revelation chapter 2, possibly only 232 of the 7,000 Zadok. And notice the sixth plague in Revelation chapter 16 is three unclean spirits like frogs because of the innumerable multitude the locust army will appear to be in the consumer stage thereof come out of the mouth of the dragon who 
with Satan and out of the mouth of the beast, the supernatural element of the one world system, the fallen angels in other words, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, Satan's role of Antichrist when his image is transmitted throughout the world at 666. The positive plagues here would then be the fire that is the truth that comes out of the mouth of the two witnesses who are most likely Moses and Elijah who at that point will have become the two candlesticks, light meaning the truth as opposed to the darkness meaning the deception as seen in plague number 5 in Revelation 16 and obviously the days of the prophecy of the two witnesses will be transmitted throughout the world also. That's the only way they can torment them that dwell on the earth during those 75 days. Count back 75 days from the seventh plague which is when the true Christ returns and you'll end up five days before 666 when the 70 evenings begin and then add another three and a half days to cover the time between when Satan kills the two witnesses and when they're resurrected and you end up with eight and a half days. In my opinion that's when they're the two olive trees not becoming the two candlesticks until 666 when Satan appears as the false Christ in Jerusalem and when added to the seven candlesticks that are the seven churches as well as the candlestick in heaven written of in Revelation chapter 4 verse 5 symbolic of those who return with Christ at the seventh trumpet the rest of the seven thousands of dock in other words that's ten candlesticks just as there were in the original temple that was burned by Nebuchadnezzar a type of Antichrist but once the entire millennial priesthood are gathered to Jerusalem to be used by Christ to teach discipline to all who fail to take part in the first resurrection it'll be all one candlestick again just as it was in the tabernacle after the plagues in Egypt that ended with the first Passover. Christ becoming our Passover in his first advent, which is why he's called the Lamb of God, who doesn't return as King of Kings and Lord of Lords until immediately after that half hour written of in the seventh seal, which is the seventh trumpet and the seventh plague. Just as the first six trumpets you can read of in Revelation chapters 8 through 11 are trumpets of deception, so it is with the first six plagues of Revelation 16, the vials that are poured out first on the earth, so to speak, beginning in 1830, and that's when the any moment now rapture deception entered into the world via patient Zero, who was a mentally ill teenage girl named Margaret MacDonald. It was also just before when educational reform would begin, setting up the system to brainwash the world into believing leaving whatever lies fit into the agenda to eventually create a one world government. This is also when the mainstream media was created, mainly in the latter half of the 19th century. So these be pestilences of the mind, again plagues of deception leading up to when most Christians are killed spiritually at 666, when those three evil spirits like frogs because they'll be all over the world coming through the TV, smartphones, and computers at that time out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And that's when the mark of the beast becomes a reality at 666. So then obviously the vial was poured out in 1830, but the actual event can't happen until Satan appears as Antichrist at the sixth seal, the sixth trumpet, and the sixth vial. The image of the beast, which is also written of in the first vial, being an image of Satan transmitted throughout the world when he appears as the false Christ. But it was first poured out upon the earth, so to speak, in 1830, in my opinion, with the hidden dynasty of education. 1913 to 1945 with economics and politics with the Federal Reserve and the United Nations and those vials were poured out upon the sea and fountains of water the waters being symbolic of peoples multitudes, nations and tongues both being turned into blood so to speak called in Revelation chapter 16 verse 3 the blood of a dead man which means at 666 most Christians will begin taking communion to Satan instead of Christ which is what Antichrist means when he causes the sacrifice in the oblivion to cease in the midst of the week as it's written in Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. Daniel's 70th week was seven years but it's been shortened to five months. The deception of economics and politics being two more ways most Christians will be killed spiritually at that time. 1948 being when the fourth vial was poured out which lines up with the fourth trumpet also in the hidden dynasty of religion and check out that word smitten in verse 12 of Revelation chapter 8 and you'll find out it's the same word translated plague 
plagues here in Revelation 16. It's also the same word translated wound in Revelation chapter 13, as in the deadly wound to the one world political system, which is the fifth plague in Revelation chapter 16, verses 10 and 11, poured out upon the seat of the first beast that doesn't come into being until the woe of the fifth trumpet after the great horn of the he-goat written of in Daniel chapter 8, verse 8 is broken, so to speak, which is the United Nations. Then the new world order replaces it at that time when Satan and his angels are cast from heaven to earth. That's when Revelation 13 begins with the one world system having seven heads, which are the seven continents of the planet earth coming up out of the sea, which is symbolic of peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And then after it's wounded to death, so to speak, is when Satan appears in Jerusalem as the false Christ. And all these plays go into their ultimate meaning when the spiritual death of the third you can read of in Revelation chapter 9 transpires by way of the deception that Christ has returned when it's really Satan instead of Christ, the false prophet written of in the sixth vial. Satan himself, who is also the dragon with the beast here, being specifically the supernatural element of the one world system that you can also read of in Revelation chapter 9, where we also see the Euphrates, which the sixth vial was poured out upon. The locust army, who are Satan's 7,000 fallen angels, go into the consumer stage at 666 when the four angels are loose from the great river Euphrates, as you can see in Revelation chapter 9. That's when that third dies spiritually because of the deception that goes out over the airwaves. That's why the 7,000 appeared to be 200,000 thousand because their images will be transmitted throughout the globe at that time. But as we know from Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, those who stand against Satan and his one world system will be delivered up, which is when the Holy Spirit will speak through them, and that'll be transmitted throughout the earth also, which is also the time of the testimony of the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11, beginning eight and a half days by my math before 666, the two witnesses being most likely Moses and Elijah. And notice verse 6 of Revelation chapter 11 says they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. For every negative, there's a positive, so these would have to be plagues of truth, so to speak, that will undo the plagues of deception. For example, instead of the mark of the beast in the first vial, those who come out of the confusion during the sixth trumpet upon hearing the truth receive the seal of God, the opposite of the mark of the beast. In other words, they have the truth in their mind, enough of it to be restored to God's family tree and take part in the first resurrection. And we already read that the two witnesses have power over waters, which are symbolic of peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues to turn them to blood. But in this case, that's the atoning blood of the true Christ, as you can see in your Strong's Concordance. The truth will cause those who are deceived to repent, whereby they can be restored to the many-membered body of the true Christ. And we also see in Revelation chapter 11, this time in verse 5, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, out of the mouths of the two witnesses. The truth, as opposed to the deception we read of in the fourth vial. In the fifth vial, which is the deadly wound, is followed by darkness, which symbolizes deception. The opposite of that would be light, which symbolizes truth. The two witnesses being the two candlesticks, as you can see in Revelation chapter 11, verse 4. They're the two olive trees for that first eight and a half days, and then they become the two candlesticks whenever Satan appears as the false Christ. And three and a half days before the true Christ returns, Satan will kill the two witnesses, as you can also see in Revelation chapter 11. And it stands to reason the testimony of the two witnesses will be transmitted throughout the world also via the modern day technology, because as you can see in verse 10 of Revelation chapter 11, these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And three and a half days after Satan kills the two witnesses, who are most likely Moses and Elijah, they're resurrected, after which the 7,000 fallen angels are killed, and the seventh angel sounds, the seventh trumpet being the seventh vial also, and they both happen immediately after the half hour written of in the seventh seal. In other words, the true Christ doesn't return until 777, which is after 666, the seventh vial being poured out into the air, and as you can see in Revelation chapter 16, verse 17, there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done, all being changed into spiritual bodies at that time when the true Christ returns at 777. <laughs>
As Christ says in Matthew chapter 24 and verses 4 and 5, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in his name, saying, I am Christ, claiming to be the Messiah, in other words, and shall deceive many. The first seal here being an all-purpose warning, including those who claim to be messengers of Christ when they're really deceivers, whether it be knowingly or unknowingly, and ultimately this is a warning about the appearance of the false Christ, who is the rider of the white horse in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, as opposed to the rider of the white horse in Revelation chapter 19, which is the true Christ, but in the build-up to 666, which is when Satan appears as the false Christ in Jerusalem, 1948 was when Kenite occupied Israel came into being, beginning this final generation, which is the generation of the fig tree, the first seal lining up with the hidden dynasty of religion, and this is when the spirit of Antichrist went out conquering, beginning in 1948, and finally to conquer at 666, when Satan appears in Jerusalem as the Antichrist which means instead of Christ. That word conquer is Nikeo in the Greek, and it's at the sixth seal, the sixth trumpet, and the sixth vial that Satan's fallen angel locust army goes into its fourth and final stage, which is the consumer stage, the Nicolaites, you can read of in Revelation chapter 2, when the rider of the white horse in the first seal finally conquers, so to speak, which is Nikeo in the Greek, the Nicolaites being what the fallen angels are called in the consumer stage in Revelation chapter 2, and that word bow in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, is toxon, meaning as the simplest fabric, so a cheap fabric imitation of Christ Jesus having two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, because he is the dragon, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, claiming to be the king of kings and lord of lords, when he's really the king of Tyrus, which means rock, meaning the false rock, and the stones worn smooth, who are the Kenites, came from the false rock, and the Kenites, which means the sons of Cain, would go on to infiltrate the priesthood, becoming the scribes and Pharisees, Christ called the generation of vipers in Matthew chapter 23, and in 1948, Kenite occupied Israel came into being, learning the parable of the fig tree having to do with understanding what the leaves on the fig tree Christ spoke of in verse 32 of Matthew 24 are symbolic of, fig leaves being what Adam and Eve covered themselves with after they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, causing Eve to be impregnated by Satan with Cain, and the sons of Cain began globalizing their four hidden dynasties in 1830 with education. 1913 with economic, 1945 with the political, and 1948 with religion, lining up with the first seal, the fourth trumpet, and the fourth vial. And when Satan appears as Antichrist at 666, the fire that comes out of the mouths of the Nicolaites, who are his fallen angel locust army in the consumer stage, is what kills that third spiritually. That third being most Christians, only Christians can die spiritually. The fire, smoke, and brimstone being symbolic of the deception that causes most Christians to worship Satan instead of Christ, which is what Antichrist means, at the woe of the sixth trumpet when the one world political system becomes a one world religious system and the first six seals, trumpets, and vials go into their ultimate spiritual meanings at that time. The half hour written of in the seventh seal beginning at that time also, but it's not until immediately after that latter half of the hour of temptation that the true Christ returns at the seventh trumpet and the seventh vial. So 777, which is after 666, the fourth vial being poured out in 1948, which lines up with the hidden dynasty of religion being the same thing as the fourth trumpet and the first seal, and the spirit of Antichrist through the Kenite religion, which is the Nacar written of in the book of Proverbs, went forth conquering in 1948 and to finally conquer at 666, when men are scorched with fire, so to speak, as it's written in Revelation chapter 16, verse 8 in the fourth vial, which again lines up with the hidden dynasty of religion and the fire, smoke, and brimstone that issues out of the mouths of the locust army is the deception that causes that third to worship Satan instead of Christ when his religious one world system comes into being at 666 and the virgin bride of Christ becomes the whore of Babylon for the most part including even the 144,000 who are the second group listed in the parable of the sower when you look at it in the ultimate futurist sense the first group in Matthew chapter 13 verse 19 being those who never were Christians so the two thirds of the world during 666 who were already spiritually dead and and then the 144,000 are those written of in verses 20 and 21, with the rest of Christianity being the third group in Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. And finally, those of the 7,000 or 232 of that number, possibly, or group number 4 in verse 23. And when they're delivered up and the Holy Spirit speaks through them during the sixth trumpet, whosoever will, along with the 144,000, will become part of group number 4 in the parable of the sower also, when they're grafted back into God's family tree. So going
going back to the 144,000, this time in Matthew 13, verses 5 and 6, notice it says, When the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. That word scorched being in the fourth vial also, and it's the same word in the Greek. And when Jesus interprets the parable in Matthew 13, verse 21, he says, They, the 144,000, ultimately dureth for a while, but when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. And that word offended in the Greek can even mean to entice to apostasy, as in to join the Kenite Nacar religion, becoming a Zur in the Hebrew, which means an apostate, scorched with the fire of deception, and killed spiritually at that time. Some of those of understanding shall fall, as it's written in Daniel chapter 11, verse 35. But again, being the church in Smyrna, the 144,000, upon hearing what the Holy Spirit will say through the 232, which are Philadelphia, in my opinion, will repent at that time when the seed of the seal of God comes to fruition in their forehead. Those seeds being planted during the grace period of the fifth trumpet, which we are now in. And once the great horn of the he-goat, written of in Daniel chapter 8, verse 8, which is symbolic of the United Nations, is broken, so to speak, is when the woe of the fifth trumpet transpires and the one world political system, written of in Revelation chapter 13, emerges at the beginning of the five-month-long hour of temptation. And then after the deadly wound, which is the fifth vial of Revelation chapter 16, 666 transpires when Satan appears as the false Christ. And the 232 are at that time delivered up to death, which is one of Satan's names, at which time the Holy Spirit will speak through them. And whosoever will, as well as the 144,000, will repent and be grafted back into the tree of life, which is the many-membered body of the true Christ, becoming part of group number four in the parable of the sower also at that time. Those that heareth the word and understandeth it in verse 23 of Matthew 13, becoming part of the millennial priesthood when the true Christ returns at 777. The writer of the white horse in Revelation chapter 19, whose name is called the word of God. So let no man deceive you by any means, as it's written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him at the seventh trumpet won't happen until after the sixth trumpet, when Satan appears as the false Christ in the apostasy occurs. And again, as Christ says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, take heed that no man deceive you. When we look up the word tongues in the Strong's Concordance, as it appears in the book of Acts, as you can see, the word tongues plural is there five times. Tongues plural because it was understood in every language with there being no need for an interpreter. The true Pentecostal tongue, the twelve apostles who were the first of the three groups we see in the book of Acts being spoken through by the Holy Spirit in the true Pentecostal tongue, as you can see in Acts chapter 2, the twelve apostles being of the Zadok, who Christ will bring bring with him upon his return at the seventh trumpet, in my opinion. But when Satan appears as the false Christ at the sixth trumpet, all that dwell on the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, which means the destruction of the first world age when Satan first rebelled. The 7,000 Zadok, who you can also read of in Romans chapter 11, fought against Satan at that time, which is why their names are written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Those God did foreknow, as it's written in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, who are predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, the Lamb slain, the Lord Jesus Christ. They're predestined to become Christians, having no free will of their own, having been judged back in the first world age at Satan's first rebellion. And again, I'm of the opinion that most of the Zadok have already lived and died throughout the centuries, and that it's possible only 232 of that number will be alive and remaining at the sixth trumpet when Satan appears as Antichrist, which is when they're delivered up and the Holy Spirit speaks through them in the true Pentecostal tongue, as it was in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, ten days after the true Christ ascended into heaven on Pentecost day when the Holy Spirit spake through the twelve apostles, who are most likely half of the twenty-four elders you can read of in the book of Revelation, which are part of the seven thousand. So we see a type of how it will be during the sixth trumpet with those who are delivered up, verified by God through Peter when he quoted from Joel chapter 2 verses 28 through 32 and Acts chapter 2 verses 17 through 21. But notice also that we see this word tongues in Acts chapters 10 and 19 bearing in mind that after the Zadok are delivered up and the Holy Spirit speaks through them during the sixth trumpet, the 144,000 come out of the confusion as they're predestined to do and in my opinion some of them are then delivered up also when the Holy Spirit speaks through them as well. I say some of them 
because that's the word Christ uses in Revelation chapter 2 when speaking to the church in Smyrna, which I believe to be symbolic of the 144,000. Have you been sealed with the truth before the hour of temptation began with the seed of the seal of God, but it's only when they hear the Holy Spirit speak through the Zadok that the seal of God actually springs forth in their mind, whereby they can't be deceived any further, the latter rain being God's truth from heaven via the Holy Spirit. And we see a type of the 144,000 also in the book of Acts in the 19th chapter, in my opinion. Notice the 12, Paul finds, spake with tongues and prophesied when Paul, who was one of the Zadok, laid hands on them after they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and received the Holy Spirit, the 144,000 being made up of 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes, which could be why we see this number 12 here. And notice in verse 8, they went into the synagogue with Paul and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. And notice in verse 9, we see that Paul departed from them, separating the disciples, documenting that the twelve went into the synagogue also. And remember, Christ says in Mark 13, they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for Christ's sake, during the sixth trumpet, for a testimony against them. And notice the different levels of the delivering up there, councils and synagogues and rulers and kings. The ruler of the one world religious system, which is Satan in his role of Antichrist and the ten fallen angel kings, in my opinion, and according to my understanding, the Zadok are the ones delivered up to the supernatural. Satan in his role of Antichrist, as well as his ten fallen angel kings. And Acts 19 seems to be pointing toward the 144,000 being delivered up to the synagogues, which at that time means what used to be Christian church houses, but when most Christians die spiritually at the sixth trumpet and are grafted into Satan's family tree, they become one religiously with the synagogue of Satan, the natural branches of Satan's family tree. But once the Zadok are delivered up and the Holy Spirit speaks through them, the 144,000 come out of the confusion being grafted back into God's family tree, as well as whosoever will hearken to the voice of the Holy Spirit at that time. Which brings us to the other instance of the true Pentecostal tongue in the book of Acts, this time in chapter 10, when Peter, who's one of the Zadok also, is sent to those not of natural Israel, and after he opens his mouth and they hear the words written in verses 34 through 43, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the future future ascents by process of elimination, these would be symbolic of those delivered up to the councils, possibly, we won't know for certain until during and after the fact. And the next verse is where we once again see the true Pentecostal tongue, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. They heard them in their own language, in other words, just as we see in chapters 2 and 19. There was no need for an interpreter because it was the true Pentecostal tongue, understood by whoever hears it in their own language, and it won't happen again until the latter half of the hour of temptation. These three examples being the only ones given in the book of Acts, there being only three groups written of here. The twelve apostles who are of the 7,000 Zadok in Jerusalem, symbolic of those of the Zadok alive and remaining during the hour of temptation, and the twelve written of in Acts 19 who went into the synagogue once they were converted through Paul, and again 12,000 out of each tribe make up the 144,000, which may very well well be why it's 12 written of in Acts chapter 19 as a type and an example of the 144,000, the first fruits of this second world age, the Zadok being the first fruits of the first world age, and then the Gentiles of Acts chapter 10 symbolizing whosoever will choose to hearken to the voice of the Holy Spirit during the sixth trumpet and repent being grafted back into God's family tree, the co-elect you could even say, the Greek word synelectos you'll find in 1 Peter chapter chapter 5 verse 13 called there the church that is at Babylon which means confusion but if they choose to listen to what the Holy Spirit will say and come out of the confusion then they become chosen to take part in the first resurrection which is what elect means is chosen this could apply to the 144,000 also only there's no choice in the matter in as much as they're predestined to be the first fruits of this second world age and why that is remains unknown but as speculation they could have followed Satan in the first 
first world age initially, but then came to their senses and joined the Zadok, the 7,000 who never bowed a knee to Baal, that is to say Satan. Again, speculation on my part, but regardless, when the true Christ returns with the rest of the Zadok and the elect are gathered to Jerusalem, the good figs that you can read of in Jeremiah chapter 24, whether it be the Zadok who are alive and remaining at the seventh trumpet, the 144,000, or the co-elect, which is whosoever will, decide to repent and come out of the confusion and back into the many-membered body of the true Christ. They're all in that basket of good figs at harvest time, which is the end of the world, at the seventh trumpet, which is the last trump, the trump of God. It's not until the sixth seal, the sixth trumpet, and the sixth vial that Satan appears as the false messiah in Jerusalem that the third part of men are slain spiritually, as you can see in Revelation chapter 9, beginning with verse 13. That's when the third part of men, which means humanity, are burned up, so to speak, as it's written in the first trumpet, where they're symbolized by trees in Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. And when they die, as you can see in the second trumpet, where they're symbolized by the creatures which were in the sea in verses 8. 9 of Revelation chapter 8, when they become wormwood, where they're symbolized by waters in the third trumpet, as you can see in verses 10 and 11, and when they're darkened, as it's written in Revelation chapter 8 verse 12, where they're symbolized by the sun, moon, and stars. That doesn't happen until the woe of the sixth trumpet, when Satan appears as Antichrist, and those four angels are loose from the great river Euphrates. It's the deception that Jesus has returned that kills that third spiritually, because that's when most Christians begin worshiping Satan instead of Christ, which is what Antichrist means when all six trumpets of deception are sounding at the same time. But as far as the build-up to the hour of temptation is concerned, which begins with the woe of the fifth trumpet, the first four trumpets began to sound from 1830 to 1948 when this final generation began. Then in 1969, the fifth trumpet began to sound, which for one thing is when the first digital network that would become the internet was first deployed, enabling the deception of the four hidden dynasties to be spread globally on the negative end of the spectrum. And 1969 is also when the Apollo 11 space mission transpired. And remember, it's an eagle, not an angel, but an eagle in Revelation chapter 8, verse 13 that says, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. But five is grace in biblical numerics. And once the grace period ends, the woe of the fifth trumpet transpires and the five-month-long hour of temptation begins when Satan and his angels are cast from heaven to earth. So with all that in mind, we go now to Revelation chapter 7 with a word of wisdom from our Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. The four winds always means the five-month-long hour of temptation that begins with the woe of the fifth trumpet when Satan and his angels are cast to earth, which is when the one world political system emerges, which is then wounded to death, after which Satan appears as Antichrist, and that third dies spiritually. So the fifth angel began to sound after the four hidden dynasties were globalized from 1830 to 1948, with 1969 being when the fifth angel began to sound. But five means grace in biblical numerics, and we're about to find out that the fifth trumpet involves the planting of the seed of the seed of God in the foreheads of the 144,000, after which the woe of the fifth trumpet occurs, and then after the deadly wound, Satan appears as Antichrist at the woe of the sixth trumpet, and that's when that third dies spiritually, and that's also when the Zadok, who are of the 7,000, are delivered up, and what's said through the Zadok by the Holy Spirit is the latter rain that causes the seed of the seal of God to come to fruition within the minds of the 144,000, causing them to repent and come out of the confusion fusion, which is what Babylon means, as well as whosoever will of their own free will hearken to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And from that point forward, they're no longer tormented by the deception of the locust army who are Satan's angels because they'll then have the seal of God in their foreheads, the truth of God's word in their minds, the law, the prophets, the gospels, and the epistles, which is what the four carpenters of Zechariah chapter 1 symbolize, which are really what these four angels in Revelation chapter 7 are symbolic of all 
also, because look what happens in Revelation chapter 7, verse 2. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, and four plus one equals five, as in the fifth trumpet, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And notice this word sealed is a different Greek word than the word translated as seal in verse 2. In verse 2, it's spragis in the Greek, which is a signet. And when you compare Haggai chapter 2, verse 23 with Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10, you'll find the 7,000 alluded to there as well. But here in verse 3, it's spragizo, to stamp with a signet or private mark for security or preservation. So it's the truth of God's word, that is to say the seed of the seal of God being placed within the minds of the 144,000 that will be activated by what the Holy Spirit says through the 7,000 during the woe of the sixth trumpet, causing the same sort of chain reaction we see in the book of Acts where it started in Jerusalem with the Holy Spirit speaking through the twelve apostles who were also of the Zadok in Acts chapter 2. And then in Acts chapter 19 we see another twelve and after they heard the word spoken through Paul who was also of the Zadok, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. A type of the 12,000 out of the 12 tribes that make up the 144,000. They fall initially, which means to waver, as you can see in Daniel chapter 11, verse 35. But when they hear what the Holy Spirit says through the Zadok, the seed of the seal of God is activated in their foreheads, causing them to repent, being then grafted back into the many-membered body of the true Christ. The 144,000 being the church of Smyrna written of in Revelation chapter 2, with those of the Zadok being those of the 7,000 in the Church of Philadelphia, 232 of that number possibly, with the rest of the 7,000 being those that return with Christ at the seventh trumpet. Notice that word brethren in Revelation chapter 6 verse 11 is Adelphos in the Greek, Philadelphos being Philadelphia in the Greek, the church in Philadelphia. But notice also some of those with free will of most of the other churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 come out of the confusion also when the Holy Spirit speaks through the Zadok called Antipas in Revelation. Revelation chapter 2 verse 13 and those who have free will that come out of the confusion are symbolized by the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. Notice because of the words spoken through Peter who was also of the Zadok on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit and spake with tongues as well meaning the true Pentecostal tongue which is understood by everyone that hears it. So at the same time the seed of the mark of the beast is being planted in the minds of the people of the world through the four horns of Zechariah 1 which are the four four hidden dynasties, the seed of the seal of God is being planted in the minds of the servants of our God also. Up until the woe of the fifth trumpet, when the hour of temptation begins, and after Satan appears as Antichrist, and the mark of the beast comes to fruition within the minds of most people, which is when that third dies spiritually, the Zadok are delivered up, and the Holy Spirit speaks through them, bringing the 144,000 as well as whosoever will, out of Babylon and into the truth, whereby they can be grafted back into the many men body of the true Christ, the tree of life. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower, as Christ says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 18. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, Satan that is to say, and catches away that which was sown in his heart, which means his mind, which is what's in your forehead. This is he that receives seed by the wayside. And remember back in verse 4 of Matthew chapter 13, the fowls came and devoured them up. But he that receives seed into stony places is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it, yet hath not root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. And this word offended in the Greek means to entrap, trip up, stumble, to entice to sin, apostasy, or displeasure. And that's what happens to the 144,000. As we know from Daniel chapter 11, verse 35, they fall, which means to totter or waver, or to falter or stumble, but only until the seed of the seal of God comes to fruition because of that latter rain, which is the Holy Spirit speaking through the Zadok. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he become unfruitful. And you can't become unfruitful unless you were fruitful to begin with. The ones that receive seed among the thorns are everyone besides the 144,000 and the Zadok. In other words, the rest of Christianity, those with free will. And notice only
only one of these four groups didn't receive the seed, which is the word of God. In other words, they never became Christians. So the first group here are non-Christians. The other two-thirds you can read of in Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. They don't die spiritually at 666 because they weren't alive spiritually to begin with. Only a Christian can die spiritually. The second group are the 144,000 who will waver initially at the sixth trumpet, but are guaranteed to come out of the confusion before the true Christ returns at the seventh trumpet. They are the first fruits of this world age. And the third group here are everyone besides the 144,000 in the Zadok, all the rest of Christianity, in other words, those with free will. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. The Zadok initially, but when the 144,000 as well as whosoever will from the other two groups come out of the confusion also when they hear the Holy Spirit speaking through those who are delivered up, they receive seed into the good ground also. So the first group has free will, but they were never Christians. The other two thirds you can read of in the last two verses of Revelation chapter 9. The second group are the 144,000. The third group are the rest of Christianity who have free will. And the fourth group is the Zadok, but whenever those of the 144,000 or those with free will come out of the confusion and repent, they go into the fourth group also when they hear the Holy Spirit speak through those of the Zadok. And that's when you see the same sort of chain reaction you see written of in the book of Acts. And the 144,000 and the Zadok and whosoever will repent and return to the true Christ will take part in the first resurrection into eternal life. When the true Christ returns at the seventh trumpet with the armies of heaven, the rest of the 7,000, and he'll send his angels to gather his elect from the four winds, which always means the five month long hour of temptation. In this case, at the end of it, when the true Christ returns at the seventh trumpet. As you can see in Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 24, after interpreting the parable of the sower, Jesus put forth another parable unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. And notice here the wheat is called fruit and the tares are not. The tares being the same thing as the evil fig of Jeremiah 24 that cannot be eaten as opposed to the good figs, which are the natural branches of God's family tree as well as those grafted in. So to bring forth fruit for the kingdom of heaven means to plant seeds of truth as we saw in the parable of the sower, whereby if God chooses that seed to grow within the mind of the person it was planted within, they become part of God's family tree also. This is why in Mark 13, Christ says the fig tree in the parable brings forth leaves only because he's speaking of the Kenites who are the the natural branches of Satan's family tree and the evil figs of Jeremiah 24, along with those who become evil figs by adoption between now and harvest time, which we're about to find out is the end of the world. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? And the field is the world, as we'll see in verse 38, from whence then hath it tares. He said unto them, An enemy hath done this, which is the devil, as we'll see in verse 39. The servant said unto him, Will thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. The wheat being those on God's family tree, and the tares being those on Satan's family tree. Both have natural branches, which are the Kenites on the evil tree, unless they decide to convert to Christianity and those of the twelve tribes on the good tree, so long as they're Christian. Christ being Abraham's seed, and if you're in Christ, and only if you're in Christ, as we know from Galatians chapter 3, then you're Abraham's seed and an heir according to the promise of eternal life. Let both grow together until the harvest, which is the end of the world. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. But the tares, which are the same group as the goats in Matthew 25 and the evil figs of Jeremiah 24, are not actually cast into the lake of fire and blotted out of existence until after the thousand years are finished. And that's only if they follow Satan again at 
that time. So to skip down to verse 37 of Matthew 13, where Christ interprets the parable, he that sowed the good seed is the son of man. And when you've seen Christ, you've seen the father who formed Adam, then Eve, and from Eve would come Cain and later Seth, the two family trees originating from what happened in Genesis 3 when Satan impregnated Eve with the father of the Kenites, and in Genesis 4 when Adam impregnated Eve with Seth to replace Abel, whom Cain slew, beginning the bloodline from which Christ would be eventually born through the Virgin Mary. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. But a tare can become wheat, that is to say a Christian, and a Christian can become a tare by adoption, as most will at 666 when Satan appears as the Antichrist. The harvest is the end of the world at 777 when the true Christ returns at the seventh trumpet, the seventh vial, and immediately after that half hour written of in the seventh seal. And the reapers are the angels, as you can see in Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31, when the true Christ returns, he'll send his angels to gather his elect, as well as all who are part of God's family tree at that time, that is to say the good figs of Jeremiah 24, and they'll be gathered from the four winds, which always means the five-month-long hour of temptation, in this case at the end of it. And then in Matthew 24, verse 32, as you can see, now learn a parable of the fig tree, the final generation beginning in 1948, when Kenite occupied Israel came into being and ending at harvest time when the true Christ returns. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. But again, not until after the thousand years are finished, as you can see in Revelation chapter 20, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend in them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire after the thousand years are finished, if they choose to follow Satan again, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, having either taken part in the first or the second resurrection and going into the eternity, which is the third world age. <laughs>